The title of this morning's message is Tragedy and Triumph. For those of you who have not studied this particular book of the Bible lately, allow me to give you a brief synopsis. Jerusalem had been laid to waste by Babylon, and most of its people were brought into captivity. Of the people who were captured and made to serve their captors, some of the names you might recognize are Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and of course, the focus of my message this morning, Nehemiah. Before I continue, I want to mention a pattern that I have noticed throughout the Bible. Have you ever noticed that the Hebrews, Israelites, or modern-day Jews quite often find themselves in positions of power and influence? What do I mean by that? Well, Joseph was an advisor to Pharaoh, second only to Pharaoh himself. Moses lived the life of royalty as a prince of Egypt before he killed the supervisor who was beating the Hebrew slave. And Esther saved her people from destruction at the hands of Haman. In the modern day, many Jews are wealthy and in positions of power and influence in all industry and commerce. The nation of Israel itself is an amazing place, surrounded by enemies on all sides, with several Arab nations who would like nothing more than to see them wiped from the face of the earth. Not only do they survive, they prosper. They have made amazing discoveries in science and technology. There is something about them that makes them special, but yet they are the most hated people on earth. Hitler exterminated six million Jews during World War II. This goes beyond just normal human jealousy or wanting to get the things that they have but not willing to do the things that they do to get them. So what are the two things that make the Hebrew people so successful? Number one, they find a need and they passionately fill it, no matter what it is. And the second and most important quality that they possess is their devotion to God. I believe this is the reason the world hates them so and hates us by association. Jesus himself has told us that as the world hates him, it will also hate his followers, whether it be the twelve apostles or us. An example of a Hebrew or Israelite or Jewish person who exhibited godly devotion is Nehemiah. As one of the people who was taken away from his homeland, the personal qualities he exhibited in his daily life brought him to the position of being a cupbearer for the king of Babylon, who was Artaxerxes at that time. Nehemiah had heard from some of the remnant that remained in Jerusalem. He was told that the temple was in ruins, and this saddened him greatly. The king noticed his demeanor and asked what grieved him so, as we just heard Brother Mark read. So Nehemiah told him, Now as people who, who love God and seek to serve God, we are often granted special favor. I say we because as believers in Christ, we are grafted into the promises that God made to Abraham and to his descendants. Not only did the king allow Nehemiah to go home, he gave him letters of authority to get the supplies he needed 
to help rebuild the house of God. There has always been, and there will always be, conflict between people who seek to serve God and people who seek to serve themselves. People who have fallen for Satan's lies and deceptions. It's this way today, and it was so during Nehemiah's time. After Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem and began work on rebuilding with the people the remnant would stay, opposition began to rear its ugly head. Specifically, a man by the name of Sanballat, Tobiah the Ammonite, the people of Ashdod, and the Arabs in the area all began to ridicule and insult the workers. <clears throat> the workers just kept working, doing what they needed to do. When they saw that their taunts and insults were not deterring the workers, things grew more intense. They began to threaten the workers, saying they would kill them and destroy their work. So now, not only did Nehemiah have to focus on the work of rebuilding, he had to keep up the morale of his workers and be wary of attack. He divided the workforce so that some would stand guard while others worked. Further on in the book of Nehemiah, in chapter 4, verse 23, it says this, <coughs> Neither I, nor my brothers, nor my men, nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water. Kind of reminds me of the story I told you all a few weeks ago about our Lance Corporal Imes in the message of uh, how to equip yourself with the full armor of God. You don't go anywhere without a weapon. Nehemiah had enemies within and without. As if the angry neighbors outside were not enough, there were corrupt people in Jerusalem who were governors of sorts and charging the people taxes in the name of the king of Babylon. Nehemiah soundly challenged and rebuked those officials and let it be known that he was working with the blessing of the king. <clears throat> Shortly thereafter, King Artaxerxes appointed Nehemiah to be the governor of Jerusalem for a period of 12 years. Instead of taking the money that was allotted to the governor's position, Nehemiah used it to feed the poor in the city and right the wrongs committed by the corrupt officials. So by this point in time, the walls were back up, much to the chagrin of the neighbors. <laughs> Sanhalat sent Nehemiah a message. He said, come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Oro. Nehemiah was nobody's fool. He knew that they would have killed him if he went to meet them. He sent messengers saying, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, I'm kind of busy right now. So after four times of this, Sambalot sent another letter to Nehemiah, what we might call a smear campaign or fake news in these times. And I'm going to paraphrase and put it in plain language. Now look here, Nehemiah. All the nations know, and Geshem says it is true, that you and the Jews are planning to rebuild. So you are building this wall. We have also heard that you plan to make yourself king and have appointed prophets to proclaim this in Jerusalem. If you don't meet with us, we're going to tell the king on you. Nehemiah told them to stop their nonsense. They were just making it up. That kind of reminds me of our emergency meeting not long ago. You remember when Pastor Renzo and myself were accused of wanting to take over this church. 
Despite all the problems and opposition, the task that Nehemiah set out to do was accomplished in only 52 days. Now you all know the things that we have to do to keep this little church maintained. Can you imagine what it must have been like for Nehemiah and his people to rebuild a whole city? When one of the stones of the wall could weigh as much as 50 pounds or more? When they did not have access to the technology that we have today? If that man didn't love God, I don't know who does. Once the work was completed, the surrounding nations felt silent. They did not know what to do. And they had to admit to themselves that God was with Nehemiah. After the work was complete, Nehemiah gathered all the people together and had Ezra read the book of the law. Nehemiah wanted to remind them why God had allowed Babylonia to destroy Jerusalem in the first place, to confess their collective and individual sin and the sins of their ancestors, and to rededicate their lives to God. This is another pattern I see repeatedly in the Bible and in people's lives, especially in my own life. Obey God's word, and you will prosper. Disobey, and you will get your butt handed to you on a silver platter. It works that way for nations, states, cities, and individuals. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. God is no respecter of persons, meaning he does not play favorites. Sometimes despicable people get enormous breaks in life, and it can make us wonder why. The best advice I can give you is worry about what you are doing, not anyone else. The Bible makes it plain that we are all to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling. Now on the surface, those of you who know me, might seem, that might seem like I'm contradicting myself, especially since during the 11 years I've been here, I've been very vocal about things at times. But sometimes God uses us, just as he did Nehemiah and so many others in the Bible, to accomplish his purposes. In every instance of complaint or rebuke or criticism I spoke can be boiled down to one thing. But the Bible says. So where do we, Transformation Bible Church, go from here? I would like to suggest, although our God has granted us a fresh start, with a pastor who is on fire for Christ as any man I have ever seen, and a wonderful group of people, new and old, who truly love and seek to serve God, I suggest that we do as Nehemiah did when he completed his task, that we approach God humbly and with great gratitude and reverence for this thing he has done for us and with us. I am already seeing signs from our other churches in the building that they are very pleased and very supportive of all of us in this endeavor, and that brings great joy to my heart. We should remain vigilant, but not so much as it interferes with the peace of the Lord or the joy that comes from serving Him. It is those qualities that will attract people to us, not any event we have. Dinners, movie nights, and other ministries are simply a way to get people to come. But it's how we treat people once they come that will determine if they come back. 
And that concludes my message this morning. Let's pray.